What's up, everybody? Welcome to an episode of Learning with Bell Vista Studios. This is the place where we get to invite people that inspire us onto the podcast and learn from them. And then luckily, we get to share that freely with you as well. So today, Hannah and I are joined by Nicole, and we're pretty excited because I personally feel like I have a lot to learn from you. Um, in terms of instructional design, people are always like, you need to be a good writer, and I am not a good writer. So you can make it happen. And the reason you can make it happen is you can have amazing teammates like this one over here that are the good writers in your team. So I'm fortunate that my weaknesses are built up by my strengths in Hannah. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. But before we get into drilling you and trying to learn everything we can <laughs> in the time that we have with you, I just want to recognize you for your effort to help others. Um, because I noticed like on LinkedIn, you really put effort into helping through the comments and that you respond to people whenever they're like, how do we do this? Or what are people noticing about this? Like you add so much value. And I think it's not just a general like, oh, I tried this or look out, look at this blog. You like, you know, like, I don't know if you use the star kind of response to uh, behavioral interview questions over there, but it's basically like, situation task action result and like you have that in your comments so anyone that wants to learn and get a deeper understanding of things i do recommend you join nicole or connect with her on linkedin because you add a lot of value and a lot of the time it's like it goes over my head i have to read it again and then i'm like it gives me stuff to think about so yeah just want to recognize you for that because i think that you add a lot of value by doing those things it's really helpful Thank you. I really appreciate that. And obviously I feel the same way. I'm your internet fan, fangirling all the time over Bell Vista and all the work you're doing over there. So that really means a lot to me. And I don't know if you feel this way, but like when you're online, it's just you in a room and you kind of don't think that you have any impact. Like a lot mm. of times my husband's like, why do you even talk to people online? And I'm like, I swear it, it's good. <laughs> so, yeah nice that you're saying it is in fact a good thing and people actually have you know something that they learn from it <laughs> yeah 100 percent. i think people do recognize and get value from it and don't it's like a thing you don't always have to get liked or but people see it beyond yeah. so your impact is kind of invisible and then one day like today you get shown appreciation or someone will message you privately and let you know but i think it's just worth spreading the love so yeah thank yeah. you Thank you. um you're welcome <laughs> so today we are talking like what i noticed from you is one of your strengths like we don't really know each other but one of the things that i noticed that you're quite good at doing is around the script writing stuff um and a, quite a few of your posts like and you've got that course that you just did um on upskill which is about script writing for video so i guess for people listening today we are going to talk about writing techniques and to listen from a lens of writing storyboards writing scripts for video or voiceover um writing scenarios for training whether that's e-learning or in your face-to-face -face. so whatever examples nicole shares or we share just remember that the tech the techniques and all that can be applied to all ranges of things so <laughs> question one dun, dun, dun. yeah pressure's on <laughs> When you are Netflix, Netflixing and chilling with your hubby, um, <laughs> when you, well, that, but when you're experiencing like shows and podcasts, what things do you kind of recognize are happening? Because I'd say you have a critical view of when you're watching things. You're like, oh God, I can't believe they did that. Or like, oh wow, they did that. And then you want to apply them to your work. So what things have you noticed from like cool shows or podcasts that you're now applying? or experimenting with? Definitely. So um, one of the things that I've really started to think about more, and you kind of know it's there, but I feel like when you're a beginner instructional designer, you have a hard time making the case for experimental stuff. Mm -hmm. So borrowing the fact that there are these plot lines or these characters that you really get invested in, uh, I think that's really powerful. And then obviously, you know, there, there's just like what's trending. So if you can like squeeze the Witcher into your course, that's awesome, but that's probably a harder sell to most clients than um, creating some kind of internal character that people will resonate with and follow, um, definitely. And then thinking cinematically, mm -hmm. 
So a lot of the content that we're writing, um, you know, even if it's not for a script, even if you're just writing content that will be shown in text, if you're thinking about things people can visualize, that makes it so much easier for them to have a mental schematic of what's happening so they can start to place those things in their working memory and then their long-term memory and make sense of them, treat them later when they need them. Mm. What specifically, like if you were to try and squeeze the Witcher into one of your projects, what would you do? <laughs> And I, it's not a show I'm aware of, so oh, I just no? know that okay. it's like famous. <laughs> what people are digging um, it at the moment. Yeah, so he, uh, The Witcher, is basically about this this guy who is a, a mutant of sorts. It's not quite X Men, but he's a mutant, and okay. he has all these superhuman abilities. And he goes and he fights all these evil beings, but then people still hate him because he's different. And that's like a common theme across, you know, a lot of the the movies that are out there today. But what I would say is that he is really complex. And so uh, even though he's he's good, there's he's still he, human. He has yep. flaws and he does things wrong. And so thinking about like what's real when you're creating a character is important. If you create a character who only ever says the right thing and only ever does the right thing and is only ever in the ideal situation, then your your audience isn't going to believe them or be invested in what happens to them. I like that. That is cool because it's hard to write scenarios. Like there's always like the right answer and then the like really wrong one. So it is a challenge to kind of make them human. And something I've struggled with, like with our projects is that we do try to make it human and we use like even things like we have one at the moment where it's an aggressive situation. The person's drunk and they're abusing one of the workers. So they, they use language like, you idiot. But then the client's like, can't use idiot. I'm just like, that happens in real life. And that's like an extreme, I guess, because everyone's got their perspective on cursing and stuff. But they do try to create the perfect scenario. And what you always hear from people in the organizations is like, we need the gray. We get the good and we get the bad. We need the gray. So... <laughs> Yeah. What, any things, tips to share on that? I think um, write the gray, but then mm. you're going to have to make the case for it. So go back and say, well, learners are telling me that they're experiencing X. And so don't you want to give them that uh, opportunity to practice it before they have to do it? And maybe there's real world consequences for not have ever having seen the fact that there is this gray area. Um, obviously, you're going to have clients that are still going to say no. And then you have to do what they want because they're paying you. But <laughs> a lot of clients are actually amenable once you make the case and you explain why you're making these choices. As long as you can explain why you're making the choices, they'll either come around or, or you can, you know, negotiate and figure out. And so maybe that's one of the other big differences about writing for instructional design. If you're just like um, writing and you enjoy writing and you're writing a script or a screenplay, you're passing it off. It's wonderful. It's this piece of art. But you know, everything we write for instructional design is up to criticism by our clients. And, and so it's like an added level of challenge to figure out what they're going to say is okay versus what you think really needs to go in there. But you do need to respect them. You yeah. Know. Okay. Fine. Magic. <laughs> <laughs> what, are, what do you think are kind of the key elements for a good story? Like, not like a beginning, middle and end kind of thing. But I don't know, what other things could you say are just practical quick wins people can try to get into if they're writing a scenario, for example? Yeah, practical quick wins. So keeping it short and sweet. So, you know, don't write 22 paragraphs where a text would do. Yeah. That's definitely one of them. One line, one sentence, try to keep it short. Um, make it sound natural. I know sometimes when I pass things off to SMEs, they'll start correcting my grammar. And I'm like, I know it's grammatically incorrect, but this is not what a character would sound like in real life. Yeah. If I'm writing for a voiceover artist, they're not going to say, you cannot do that. They're going to say, you can't do that. You know, uh, and that changes things. And so being natural to human expression and not worrying as much about grammar, sort yeah. of important, but not really important. That's another one. Um, if you can make it sound natural, that's definitely a quick win. Uh, and then showing, not telling. That's the thing I learned in fiction class. 
Mm. So you don't have to tell your audience that the person walked down the stairs, walked across the kitchen, put their hand on the refrigerator door, opened it, and took a glass of milk out to understand how they got the glass of milk in their hand. Just tell them what you need to tell them. Show them the action, right? So they're sipping the milk. Okay, we got all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Because that's something that I think I struggle with is like what's necessary for the story and what's ramble. And I'm a rambler. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm all in support of rambling. So maybe that's another tip. Like I Shitty First Drafts by Anne Lamott, whose name I hopefully did not butcher, is one of like the best short essays I think I've ever read as a writer. And it really is just about everyone writes shitty first drafts whether they want to admit it or not it's very unusual that someone is able to just get from idea in their head to perfect manuscript it almost never happens but in order to get from point a to point b to that really great product you have to be willing to let yourself write it cross things out kill your darlings that's another crazy thing you have to be willing to let it go but but don't like put so much pressure on yourself to write it perfectly first you know make a mess throw it up on the page, clean it up. And then that's how you're going to get to that good end product. Otherwise you end up kind of stifling yourself and you, you need that experimentation to let yourself get to the better ideas. Like for me, usually it's like a third time's a charm thing. I'll write down an idea first and it's kind of like, uh, and then I clean it up and I'm like, this is really disorganized now because I patchwork things. Then maybe by like the third time I get to what I like. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I think, so Hannah does a lot of our scenario writing and stuff, and I'm so grateful for that because when they come to me, I can think of it from, is this meeting the performance objectives perspective? But if I had to start with like a blank page, I I tried to write a blog one time and two lines took me six hours. So (laughs) it's really good because I can come in objectively and I think it's like that fresh mindset so if you can have someone else read it or if you solo like go for a walk because I feel walks are so good like you get they just make you think differently you get new ideas you critique you're able to improve and then you can come back with a fresh perspective and have a look at it as well yeah and if you're ever stuck that's just such great advice you know take five and walk away from it and come back to it because nothing is worse for writer's block than just sitting there and looking at the page or you can go with the reverse philosophy and you just literally keep writing until you get to something i'm of the walk away and come back philosophy though i have what teachers do do, who say right i don't know what to write until you write a sentence and then you can highlight that sentence and start and take that nice. so whatever works for you is really the right answer but i like the walk <laughs> what works for you hannah i think for me i probably look like i am a rambler so i can <laughs> a lot can get onto the page. Like I can think of a lot of things and get it all out there. And then I think that's why it's good that we work well together because I get it all out there and then you can look at it and refine it and say, okay, does that meet the goal? Or we could potentially adjust this. So I think it sort of comes naturally for me to get lots lots of information out, but it might not be on point, if that makes sense. No, but it is because anytime you get, you send me a script, it's like 90% there. I'm just like, how'd she get there? you know how you get there? Like, I don't change much of your stuff. It's just like sometimes like a little tweak because I might have more context or whatever. But yeah, you, I don't think you ramble. You're definitely able to get to like, you create, a, you paint the picture, like Nicole was saying with like, drink, they're just sipping milk. Like, so you don't have the whole like walking to the fridge and da, 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 going on. And you also got the learning or the training objective in there as well. Are you, do you know how you do that? <laughs> I just love writing. I think if you're passionate about something, it can happen more naturally. Like we're all into different things. And I remember from being really young, I used to always write in a journal and I used to write stories when like it wasn't for school or anything. I just loved doing it. So I think it's just something I enjoy doing. Yeah. Do you love it, Nicole? Have you always been into writing? I guess so. I I think so. I didn't know I was until I think someone told me some, uh, when I was trying to apply for colleges, I actually wanted to be a um, horse trainer. <laughs> oh, wow. And I decided right before I was going to college that I was not going to do equestrian studies. And my mom was like, you like to read and write. Maybe just be like an English major. And 
14 years of school leader, I guess she was right. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's cool. But well, then I guess is, my, oh, sorry. You it, go the writing comes easily. Like for me to get on video, I'll sit there and record the same video 15 <laughs> times. I like created whole e-learning course curriculums that I was going to deliver. And then it's like, I don't even like my intro. This isn't happening. And like threw those ideas away. <laughs> this is terrible. Probably shouldn't do it. But, you know, um, everyone has their strengths. So I, it's great when you have a team like you and Hannah, you can collaborate and you take, you know, your strengths and her strengths and put them together and you get something really fantastic. Yeah. I think my takeaway then for people is like, there are copywriters out there and there are people that naturally are talented at writing and love writing and it's worthwhile because the writing part, the text, the script is such a key essential part of the success of the training. So maybe have a look on Fiverr or somewhere for someone to help you with that and outsource it if you are solo or look for someone that has those as their strengths. Yeah. I've got a question before we move on. Yeah. Um, Paul, so when I write scripts, I notice that because a lot of the, like the work that we do, we always make sure everything we produce meets the business goal or adds value to the business goal. But I find with, say like video script writing you often want to make it interesting as well so you want people who are watching it to be engaged and actually want to watch the video and i find it really difficult to find that line between writing content that actually adds value to the learner but then also engaging them and adding content that would interest them so i don't know if you have any tips for that i yeah that makes a lot of sense um I think it comes back to sort of what I was saying before. You can make something that's really interesting and maybe not linear and obvious that still meets the business goals. But in those cases, you probably will have to make a little more of a case to your client because they won't be obviously able to go in with like a highlighter and be like, okay, here's this business goal. And I see this line in the text. Uh, one really good example. I actually didn't write it, so I can't take credit for it, but I was working on an IT course, actually writing the assessment questions and, and, activities for that. So I got to watch their videos, which was cool. And they created these whole little anime skits that taught about things like badge surfing and fishing because mm. they knew their audience, but they were stories. Like they, they weren't saying, Hey, you need to do this in your training. They didn't even wrap it up and say, so you should do this, this, and this. They literally just wrote these little five minute anime shorts that had people going in and like stealing information and doing things. And um, it met the business need. But, you know, at first pass, if someone again went in and was like, well, where is this line about we must be in compliance with X, Y, and Z? It's, it's not in there. I mean, it is, but it's, it's just the line itself is not verbatim in there. Yeah. So I would say if you feel like you're meeting the goal and when the learner leaves your video, they will have the knowledge or the information or the skill they need to move forward, then you've done your work. Okay. Awesome. I feel like it's a very talented thing to do, like to be able to share information with someone in a clear way, but also do it in a way that's not clear straight away, if that makes sense. Like <laughs> I see yeah. learning solutions or things out there in the world where I'm like fully engaged in something. And then I'm like, oh my God, that thing taught me this. Yeah. That Like I find that amazing that people can do that. It must just be like a creativity thing or like, how do you do fairy tales I mean we all read them growing up but you know Little Red Riding Hood taught us not to talk to strangers and at the end of the story they weren't like well don't talk to strangers <laughs> like Peter and the wolf you know don't cry wolf well we all know that you shouldn't lie about something because when it really happens people won't believe you but they didn't say don't don't lie and then people won't believe you next time they just told us a story a fable and we came to understand it that's cool I love that I reckon that would work with um, clients as well. Like when you're saying to your stakeholders, this is why we don't have the, you don't do this in the thing. Like remember when you were a little kid or yeah. like even, you know, how you watch like Toy Story and Shrek back now as an adult and you're like, how did I miss all that crazy stuff in there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are those people. <laughs> do you, um, you were talking about assessment questions. Do you write your assessment questions up front? and then go do the training around it, like what you write for, or how do you manage that? It depends on the project. It's, 
To me, I like to know what kinds of assessments I'm doing, not necessarily the questions themselves, but what am I checking for and like, what do I want them to be able to do? So if it's a test question, then that's, that's a specific activity. But if it's like some kind of reflection or if they're going out and doing a practice in an e-learning, you know, they're doing a simulation. Like as long as I know what they're doing and sort of what I want success to look like, then I think it's okay to write the video next. If I have no idea, then I don't really like to do it because to me that means I haven't figured out what my end goals are. So I'm just writing the content and that's not really what you want to drive your course. You really want it to be the performance goals, which mm. I know is something you focus on also. Yeah, I actually wanted to get your perspective on that because you do talk about that. I just love to learn from someone new. So we kind of always focus on, is it an action or behavior? Can you see it happen in the real world? Because that's what you need to create. Um, and then we focus on like need to know versus nice to know. And then when doing like learning objectives, I have, there's like a, a Google image that comes up, which is um, Bloom's taxonomy. And I'm mm -hmm. just like, what verb do I need them to do to help me get to thinking about that performance stuff? What's your process for that? Honestly, pretty similar. Oh yeah. Um, the one thing I have, I liked is I'm, uh, David, I'm going to forget his last name now. It starts with a C. It, he talks a lot about game learning and he's not talking about like gamification, like adding badges. I mean, he's actually talking about games and I really like the model he has where you break things down into task level instead of necessarily Bloom's taxonomy. So like, mm -hmm. what is the, I guess, behavior or action they should be able to do? Um, yeah. So that's just another way to sort of frame it is in groups of tasks. So what should they be able to do? when they're done with this section or what should they be able to do when they're done with this course? And then what is the big ideal business goal floating out there? I also like to think about. So, so yeah. you know, if it's, um, we want to increase revenue by improving our customer service. And in order to do that, we need to see that customers are leaving more positive reviews on our Facebook organically, then I'm letting that kind of drive in the background, even though the immediate goal might be something like handle a call center call. No, it's not a very good learning objective. I'm just going to make that up. On yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So, so things are, are driving in the background. And then that also can sometimes inform how you get inspired. So, all right, you want everyone on Facebook? Well, maybe we just, we pull a little bit of that into your course or your scripts and we think about that. Mm. Yeah. That's cool. How do you evaluate performance? Try to set those up when we start the course. So, you know, what are the goals we need to hit? Sometimes it's simple. You know, when you work with aviation, for instance, um, there's X number of incidents on the ramp a year and we want it to be Y number by next year, or we want it to reduce by 15%. Obviously there's cultural stuff, and other uh, factors that will go into it. But still, if you can get that data generally, if nothing else has changed ma massively, then you know that it at least has had some impact yeah. on the success of the course and the training. Um, it can be small wins though. It could just be like, we've never had anything before and now people say that they know how to do these things. I mean, that's yeah. a, a small win, but it works. Uh, I, I don't love evaluating a course just by like level too, I guess, if you're going with Kirkpatrick. So just seeing that, yes, we've checked off, they know in this test how to do it because that's not, that means they successfully passed the course, but not necessarily that they successfully learn how to do what you need them to do. Yeah. Do you have it, like, would you have it in your calendar to follow up with the clients or do you, I, I don't, are you in-house or you do your own stuff? I am, this is me. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, yeah, I have my own, I freelance and hopefully my goal this year, because I've luckily been pretty busy, is to work with some other folks and, and start doing some bigger projects. But I will follow up with clients. I've been really lucky since I've been freelancing to A, work with some clients from my past who decided they didn't want to work with the middleman and came directly to me. Yep. Um, and then also just to have repeat clients. So I've been lucky to kind of see what they're doing and how it's working out. Yeah. Uh, have, yeah. So that's, that's where I'm at right now. Um, I haven't had to email anyone yet, but there is one client that I think they just went live with something. So I'll probably check in and see how yeah. that's going. 
Nice. Um, I had a question now I've forgotten. So hold on one second. <laughs> Thank you. I'm What's that? Oh yeah, you go. Okay, yeah. I was just, I'm curious because for Kim and I like often talk about understanding what the actual problem is. So when we have a new client, they might think that a certain thing is the problem, but after we have a conversation with them, it could change. And I was just wondering, is that something that you do when you have a conversation with clients? Do you have a conversation to find out what the problem is and become really clear on what you're solving? It'd be great to yeah. hear. Absolutely. That's so important. I mean, knowing the business problem and knowing your learner, if you don't know those two things, then you're just creating training in a vacuum. So my process is usually, you know, you have that initial call and it's, it's more of a sales call really at that point. Um, you're learning some information, but they're trying to feel out whether or not they want to work with you. So that, that's kind of part one. Then usually once they've accepted a proposal, we'll go on and do a kickoff call. And I ask them to bring any important stakeholders with them that they want. And that's when I usually get the business perspective and I find out what they think the problem is. And then from that point, I strongly encourage some folks will say, we just can't do it. But I always try to get the learner perspective after that, whether it's through interviews or focus groups. If I have to run a survey, that's like least ideal, but I can do that too. Um, if I can look at past data, of how other courses have gone or even just what they've said about past training they've done. That's always really helpful to figure out what the learner thinks the problem is. Yeah. And the best of the best is when you can go and observe what's happening on the job. Mm -hmm. So one good example is, um, again, like my, my aviation clients are awesome, but they are, are all at different levels. And sometimes when you're not on the ground, you don't really know what's happening. So they kept wanting to create more and more and more training because something was happening. We went to go film the videos and even as we're filming the videos, they don't have enough resources to do the job the right way. So the problem is then not the training. The problem is then you're telling them they need three people to do the job, but you've only staffed two. Hmm. You wouldn't know that if you talk to just business because they would tell you, well, they're just not doing it the right way. No matter how many times you train them, they're dumb, which is like my least favorite thing when clients say, um, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So yes, 100%. Even if you're just writing a script, it might seem like it's not that important to talk to folks or to figure out what the real problem is you're solving, but it really is if you want to have something that's effective. Yeah. Do you have, um, like when you're writing scripts and stuff or scenarios, do you have little questions that you ask yourself to check? Um, is this meeting the objective, all that? To hold yourself accountable to create good writing? Yeah, I think I, I literally just go back to my objectives and I'll check and kind of make sure they look. But I am definitely trying to dot all my I's and cross all my T's. So I like to read things back as when I'm done. Um, you know, first line to last line, read it aloud because you're going to recognize if things are just hard to read for a voiceover talent or an actor. Yeah. And like one of the ones I always joke about, but you know, sometimes when you're writing, you don't realize you're rhyming, but the minute you start speaking it, you hear it and it sounds so funny. And it, especially if you're writing about something serious, it totally throws things off. So <laughs> yeah, just making sure that your content has been read aloud so you know that it's okay. And then the one I honestly don't do as much, but I should do more is when you're proofreading because you also want to make sure all the content is, um, well written you can read from the last sentence to the first sentence and just it helps your brain not fill in those blanks that you would normally fill in so that's one definitely i'll sit there with my objectives especially when i used to manage the department and i had to give everyone feedback i would literally sit there with my objectives all highlighted and i would take each one away as i felt like they were being covered um those are the big ones and then if there's something i can again show instead of tell so if there's a statistic, for instance, let's say it's 25% of dogs like <laughs> to bark at mailmen. I don't know. It's then cool. <laughs> uh, I might show, right? So I might say one in four dogs because then you can see the four dogs on the screen yeah. instead of 25%. So what can I convert from a dry telling, you know, giving me the facts to something that's more visual? So yeah. that's sort of the last pass I like to do before I turn something over. I love, yeah, I think the two takeaways, 
show not tell is really cool so what does it like thinking about what it visually looks like and the other one is that you're a closet rapper and that's why you're trying to get your rhymes into your <laughs> <laughs> yes i am totally no definitely not <laughs> my rap <laughs> game is <laughs> give us a go <laughs> <laughs> we'll be the judge and the rest of the youtube world and all next, that <laughs> next time we talk, we'll, we'll have a battle no. oh god we won't talk about <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you know um, any tips on trying to get humor or drama right in scenarios and scripts? Because, like, I've got my sense of humor, you guys have got your sense of humor. I always laugh at my jokes. Yeah. Not everyone laughs. I definitely I think it's one of the really hardest hard. things to do. I mean, I have a terrible sense of humor in that everything makes me laugh. Like, <laughs> I laugh at everything. So to me, I have to remember so that I'm not everybody is as cheesy as I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, but maybe we're on the same page, so I could write for you guys and it wouldn't be so bad. Yeah. <laughs> We'd be like, yeah. she's hilarious. <laughs> 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 so I would say, um, just, you know, you can be funny and witty, but make sure you're not being condescending or snarky because when you think you're being funny, it doesn't always come across well, or it might just make people feel defeated if they feel like, oh, you know, you're making a joke about it, but that's actually who I am. So I would, I would say uh, as a Jersey resident, I love sarcasm, but it, it doesn't belong in most scripts. And then um, I think building the drama is really just about thinking about your plot and not giving everything away up front. Yeah. Uh, for me, like a good example, I did one with I can't talk too much about it. NDAs, right? All over the place. But I did one with a healthcare company and they were talking specifically about issues that doctors face in prescribing certain kinds of medications. And so that actually can have a lot of drama because a patient, even though you can write, again, the perfect scenario and make them say, oh yes, doc, okay. Like they can get really upset. It happens all the time or they might take it very personally or they might get angry and throw things. I mean, there's all different kinds of reactions people can have, but they're not necessarily going to be a trigger switch. Like you can see those things building, someone getting more agitated. You can see someone um, yell and you can write those things into your script, like angry brackets, right? And tell them <laughs> voiceover talent that that's what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so I think it's just really important to think about how human emotions play out, but also if the more you can think about characters, I think this has been really helpful for me, thinking about characters and how they're responding and reacting rather than thinking about dropping um, lines into a scene, sometimes yeah. that helps to, to build a more natural interaction. So if I just think, Bob's this 47 year old man who's uh, going to the doctor for the first time in the year and it's a new doctor and Dr. Katie is a young doctor and she gets upset because people don't take her seriously. How are they going to talk? Like what's going to happen in that conversation? Yeah. I feel like I'm getting my popcorn out now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could, it could be a good one. Uh, but you see? Personas, just like learner personas are very helpful. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, question for you two then. Because I know Hannah and Victoria, one of our other team members, they always go on about this bloody podcast that is like, it's like a crime one and it revisits like true <laughs> stories. What's it called, Hannah? Scale. Sword and Scale. Okay. So they, it's, I think it's like narrative and it's like this went down, you know, and then it will cut to like interviews with people that knew the people. So they really like build that drama and the storytelling quite well in a podcast thing rather than just like a back and forth or like someone reading a story. So for both of you, what things are hooking you at the moment that you're that other people could go check them out like a good movie or a good like I don't know documentary someone that's doing good storytelling that you've just been captivated by recently so that other people can go out and watch or listen to them and then appreciate and view them with all the tips that we've been talking about today to help improve their writing Gosh, I um Give me one minute to think about it. <laughs> I'll do some entertaining dances. I, I have like the worst taste in movies and, and everything. Like I said, I have a really cheesy uh, sense of humor. So at the end of the day, when I'm done working, 
I don't listen to anything serious. Like recently I watched AJ and the Queen on Netflix, which is RuPaul's new series. Okay. And I I couldn't get anyone else to watch it <laughs> because it's so terrible. But um yeah, but so why that's do you that. watch it? Why is it hooked to you? Why is it hooked to me? First of all, I love drag, which is a really yeah. weird thing, maybe for me to love, but I do. I just think it's so fun watching the larger than life, again, maybe that's part of it, the larger than life characters and how they like really embody and personify womanhood, but in this caricature way. And they're just, I think they're very talented in makeup and costume, which, you know, my eye is drawn to. But then, you know, for that show in particular, what I did like was that there are some very serious, serious topics in what seems like a very humorous show. So um, AJ has a mother who's a heroin addict. And, and that's sort of like an underlying theme is that she's kind of a runaway, but also kind of the mom doesn't really know what's happened to her. Like mm. she's just so away. And then you have uh, RuPaul's character. I think it's Robert, who's a aging drag queen. And they talk about loneliness and they talk about the fact that he gets um, conned by his boyfriend into giving away his life savings. And so these are very serious things, but then he comes out in like a feather boa and you know, a Bob Mackie dress and stuff like that. So I like that they can do both and maybe that's a good takeaway as a writer, but the idea is always right to steal like an artist. So you you can watch things with a critical eye and watch them for style choices rather than just watching them for entertainment. Yeah, that's cool. Good what breakdown. You know? I'm so interested show. to know because it sounds like you have much more sophisticated taste than I do. <laughs> really watch stuff hey like I don't yeah that's I can't really answer because I don't watch tv or movies or anything terrible I gotta get back yeah <laughs> good thing Kim <laughs> <laughs> what's yours Hannah um I think for me like I really love documentaries mm. so I love when it's like really real and raw so one that I was watching recently is super random but it's like an f1 formula documentary oh i love senna yeah oh that's a good one so good yeah Yeah. and just the way they do it like it's just amazing to see the behind the scenes and the emotions that people have and it's all like very real it doesn't and some scenes you think like why am i even watching this it doesn't really add value but it just like gives you like a feel of what's actually happening and you feel like you're actually there so Mm. i think me, that's what I love where it's really like raw and real and not over the top but just like showing you exactly what's happening in a situation yeah, yeah. what's really cool about his documentaries is that he didn't film any of it he's taking clips of, of it's curated it's amazing yeah. Yeah. Content. yeah I think he also did um Amy is that the one Amy about Amy houses Mike? yeah I haven't seen that yet because I feel like I might be a little traumatized after but um yeah that's it's a real that's a really good one I like that one yeah for sure that I've is. been watching McMillions which is really embarrassing to also admit <laughs> and, and the Mandalorian you. like again my taste is just <laughs> everywhere okay, so Baby us. Yoda has my heart and I'm really interested in the fact that the mafia is involved in like everything that I ever thought they you know was wholesome as a kid like I just uh, and the Irishman, right? So, like, I just found out that the mob had something to do with the Kennedys, and then I learned that they were infiltrating the McDonald's millionaire uh, Monopoly games. Like, crazy things. Wow. <laughs> There's something in all this, hey, like the hooking of it. So, yesterday, um, with one of the team members, we were brainstorming. So, we have to do a video scenarios. Hannah's written the scripts. And the client's shown us like videos that they want it to be like, and it's like interaction goes down. And then within it, the one of the characters does like the good things. And then another character does the bad things. And it it was like 10 minutes long. As she's showing me, this is what we want to achieve, Kim. She's skipping it. I'm like, you're skipping it because you're bored, but you want us to create it and bore your learners. So I'm like in my gut. I was like, no, I can't do this. <laughs> and um, <laughs> also, what like, because we have this show, the Bell Vista Studio show, where we get to see other people's examples. And we watched Kath Ellis's one, which is awesome. She's created, like, that's a really good one for like drama. And she's used pos- podcasts and for like the compliance training. 
so we watch that as inspiration and that's what's so good about oh, I love just being inspired so we are like okay let's be inspired by the world around us and think about how we can do these videos differently so instead of being like here's the aggressive customer that comes in and abuses the staff member and here's the five things that they need to do to be good through our like little brainstorm we came up with this idea of like how to dramatize that but still get the ideas through this is not groundbreaking but i was like so excited that we did it it's so neat yeah. because you're like you know these things but i think until you take a step back to do the brainstorm then you don't allow space to be creative and to do them and then in hindsight you're like oh we should have done it so i'm glad that we're doing it this way for this i still have to talk to the client about it they're um, on holidays at the moment but so instead of that happening what we're thinking is that we do it as like cctv footage of the scenario going down so that we can have like the grainy look and feel of like the actual video scenario going down it's like abusive and all that kind of stuff and then what we're thinking is there's a show over here called the current affair or oh god it's like <laughs> basically like they break down the news events that have just been on tv and like this person's like tell us more about why that happened but it's freaking like really famous. I'm pretty sure like everyone watches it at like 6 p.m. or 7 p.m., whatever time it's on TV. You should probably have your own version of what that is. But so what we're gonna do is I'm thinking we'll do like the CCTV footage, like a news report and it's happened. And then she comes in as a news reporter and we're all like, who's gonna wear the wig and pretend to be the character? <laughs> um, but they'll do like an interview with an expert of like trying to understand you know why people behave this way and what can you do so it's more of like coming from that perspective as opposed to like yeah i don't know but that's how we're thinking about trying to create drama and another one is um like call centers so quite often they get abused in the call center like you don't get the nicest customers coming to say you're doing a great job sort of thing so it's going to be audio because that's how they live their lives is through a headset. Right. Um, and then we're thinking like, because it's about well-being. How do you like not get stressed with all these kind of challenging interactions? Then we're thinking, okay, well, what happens in the real world there? It's normally like you pick up your phone and you'll like message your friend or something. You're like, oh my God, like I'm having the worst day. And we're thinking like the self-help can happen through like a little text message interaction. So. Yeah, I think like there, if you open your eyes to like the shows, like go watch RuPaul and <laughs> look for those clues out there that are doing so well on HBO and like Netflix and Stan and all the YouTube and podcasts. Like there's so many clues out there. And like you say, steal like an artist and make it happen for your projects. And like we spent less than an hour brainstorming yesterday and it's completely changed how we're going to approach this project now that's cool yeah i mean those both sound amazing and if you exactly what you said didn't allow yourself the time to like sit back and and brainstorm you're not going to get there and you have to let yourself make some mistakes and go through like uh eh, no that's that's not quite gonna work but a lot of times especially when you're new like as a freelancer when you're new it's really hard to be brave enough to tell the client yeah. I don't know about what you want to do, especially if they're like a, you know, a type A personality and, and very, mm. this is what I want. And you have to make a strong case, but you definitely should make the case because they're hiring you for your expertise and your talents. And yeah. there are so many more interesting ways to do things than Bob is having a bad day. Let's <laughs> talk about what Bob can do to make it better. One, he can call his mom you know like the, the, yeah I, one of the ones we did recently um for I, I forget who it was for honestly to be at this point but we stole from like the goofy films if you remember the art of skiing where basically the voiceover artist quit and they still needed to produce some goofy films so goofy only yells that's the only thing he says the entire film but it's the narrator saying okay goofy like he's gonna i forgot what the words are. he's gonna strap on his skis and then you watch him do like everything kind of wrong, but also kind of right. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You ever see that? And then you're like, oh, as he goes over the jump. And that's it. So like stealing from that, I mean, it's, it's really, there's so much around you. We're in such a media culture right now. Yeah. I mean, if you know your learner and you know what they're into, you can make a big splash by 
by getting into the media that they're into and sort of pulling style choices from those things. Yeah, for sure. So on that, Nicole, I'd love to know, because it sounds like you've been doing like video script writing for a little while and creating learning projects. I'd love to know what's your favorite project that you've created. Just for inspiration, I'd love to know like what your top one is and one you're really proud of. I like too many of them. Um, I think one of the ones I'm proudest of, and I won't say necessarily that it was like my best foray into script writing ever, but for my aviation client, they had really nothing. And it was like some scattered ILT stuff and they taught it different in every region. And so we developed a whole series of courses for them. And one of them was just about um, incidents on the ramp. And like, it was the same thing that we're talking about where they were dryly going through the manual and just explaining things. And so having the opportunity to like kind of poke fun at what happens. Like um, we had people sword fighting on the ramps with their wands, like stupid stuff like that. And um, we had someone who like wasn't paying attention and overfills the, the bathroom blue juice and the poop floats through the hallway, like little <laughs> things like that. I think we were really, I was really proud. And I was also really proud because I, I worked on it. Um, I worked with the team on that yeah. and they all were, most of them were pretty new to instructional design. So I was able to, you know, steer that direction, but like the end product was awesome. And the client went and put it into practice and it actually paid dividends. Like they didn't have any incidents on the ramp for like six months for the first time in their airline history after that project wow. went out. And I loved working on that. And I thought the SMEs were really funny too, because they're, you know, a little bit of those blue collar folks and they're just like, we're gonna get it done. And they had really funny stories to share and they were really engaged. So the whole process was just really fun. Um, I think that's probably one of my favorites. That's cool. I believe that is. Nice. <laughs> All right, as we come to a close, Hannah, do you wanna do your quick fire questions? Yeah, I'll just see what I've got left. Um, no, I'm gonna leave at this point. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, really, cause I saw on your LinkedIn and you've spoken about it, human-centered design. And we love human centered design. Like it's something I'm really passionate about. So I just wanted to know what are like the processes and tools that you use for your work hmm. related to human centered design. Uh, I think talking to humans is probably the number one thing that I think is important in human centered design. And I think a lot of clients forget that like talking to the trainer, I, I'm going to be honest and say like, I just did a project sort of as a favor for a client whose instructional designer left midway through and I picked up and it was, it was not great training. And like, I'm almost, I'm not happy to put my name on it because it's very obvious. They never talked to any of their learners mm -hmm. and this training is going to go out and they're going to forget everything they learned. So I think talking to your learners is the number one tool for human centered design. And then the second is like thinking about what you want them to do with that information, not just the content you want them to learn. Because at the end of the day, it's like, um, you know, it, it doesn't really matter what information you store in your memory if, if you're not using it and applying it. it. That's really, really important. And then the other one would just be thinking about how people are gonna use this information and sort of the user experience. And while setting everything up, I can't claim myself a, a UX, person, but thinking just, you know, at the level that I'm capable of doing about how my user will experience the information and how it's laid out and how it's delivered. Um, you know, for like, I do a lot of high level strategy stuff. So deciding, okay, this is going to be blended learning, or you should do this is this kind of e-learning module. And this is this. Um, so thinking about like what makes sense and how people will best access it and what'll make it useful is, is also a really important part of that equation. So if they're never going to look at their computer and they're on their phones all day, well, then don't design videos that look best on a massive monitor. Make sure they're mobile friendly, things like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, uh, the only other thing I had was, uh, are there any resources or tools that you recommend? Like anything online that you use for free or like a authoring tool, just anything that you recommend? Um, I love, uh, it's pretty industry standard, but I love Camtasia for building videos when I have to do it myself. So if you're not Premiere Pro, Final Cut Pro <laughs> ready, Camtasia is awesome. And um, 
Beyond is great too if you can use that. Nice. I yeah, uh, I am all over the free resources. You know, I have a little bit of graphic design ability, but I am not like a master graphic designer. My friends who are graphic designers are amazing at what they do, and I'm not gonna act like I am at that level. So um, stuff like Pixabay, you know, I'm all over there trying to find graphics and then I'll build what I have to or manipulate Canva. I'll build and manipulate as I have to, because again, my strength is like the analysis, the strategy, the writing, and I can definitely do e-learning and I'm perfectly capable of developing stuff. But when I can collaborate with someone who like that's their passion, like my friend came over here maybe, then it comes out so much better. Um, so those are big ones. And then when I was teaching college writing, I used to give folks two resources all the time. And the first one is Grammar Girl. So if you ever have a oh, yeah. question, she has a really simple, easy explanation for you. Um, she does it in audio and text, so that's cool. And then the OWL, which is the online writing lab at Purdue University, has resources about writing kind of like everything. So whether it's how to cite something, um, how to write a presentation, how to use a grammar thing. That's always been really helpful for students and it's something that from time to time I'll still go back to, especially at the end of, you know, if I'm trying to cite all my sources for something at the end, um, sometimes I'll go back there just to make sure I'm using the right APA style if that's applicable or something like that. Yeah. Those are my go-tos. And the e-learning heroes challenges are always just really fun to look at, which have nothing to do with scripting, but I just genuinely enjoy. Enjoy it, yeah. yeah awesome, not. thank you. I feel like I could keep going. There's so much out there. The Bell Vista Instagram is great. <laughs> I love <laughs> idol courses. I love, you know, um, there's a whole bunch of folks on LinkedIn that are doing really cool things. And there's yeah. a freelancer instructional design group, both on Facebook and LinkedIn that are doing really cool things. Yeah, you can go on. I'll, I can send you a list. <laughs> well, you can. I've been documenting them. So all the things, <laughs> the resources that you've been sharing, we will put in the description link so people can grab them. Um, and the only other thing I would say, which is not quite a free resource, but um, again, not necessarily about script writing specifically, but I think Kathy Moore's Map It is like one of the best books you can read as an instructional designer, especially if you're just starting and like, um, you know, performance center or human centered design is not your forte. I think it's, it's a great book and totally worth the $30 you will spend on it. Yeah. I reckon if you, well, it's more expensive in Australia, uh, $70, but Whoa, it's probably okay. the it's most worth it, but it's um, expensive book I've ever bought, but hundred percent like it's, yeah. If you only read one book for instructional design, that's that is it. The one. Yeah. Agreed. Have you got anything you would like to share before we wrap up? Uh, about writing? No, I. Uh, well, you can share. I don't need to oh, really want to. Like, <laughs> let me write it for you. <laughs> I, I just think if, if you do nothing else when you script write, like I said, I'm just going to reiterate the fact that you need to give yourself time to experiment and brainstorm if you want to come up with something that isn't the usual dry, boring thing that is like a verbatim copy of your SME just put into text for an actor. So allow yourself the brainstorming process. Recognize that people don't write amazingly on the first time around. Let yourself throw it up and clean it up and, and yep. play with things. And that's really important. And then remember to show and not tell as often as possible. So your CCTV example was a great one because you're showing it happening instead mm. of walking through, this is the bad guy. And this is the good guy. <laughs> like, don't assume your reader is intelligent. Assume that they'll, mm. they can follow along. Obviously you have to give them all the steps, but you know, you don't have to tell them all of the steps. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing your learner will help you make the right decisions on that. Little Red Riding Hood. That's what I'm going to remember all the time. Yeah, fables are great examples. Fables, documentaries. Great. You learn through documentaries all the time. Are they sitting there and saying, what you should have taken away from this scene is. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't watch it if they did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I've learned a lot. Awesome. I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. You're a beautiful human. And thank you for like the generosity of sharing because I definitely, you've given me some things that I personally want to put into practice. So I really appreciate that. 
Yeah. Well, likewise, I'm really excited that I got to talk to you and hopefully, you know, maybe it won't be televised, but at least hopefully it won't be last. I'll find you on Instagram as I usually do or LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> well, everyone, thank you so much for listening or watching. Um, we'll connect, connect with Nicole. Her details will be in the description. Obviously, she is someone doing some great things and has some really good ideas and we can definitely learn from her. And have an awesome day.